Chapter 36 In the Wilderness For nearly forty years the children of Israel are lost to view in the obscurity of the desert. The space, says Moses, in which we came from Kadesh Barnea, until we were come over the brook Zered, was thirty and eight years, until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the host, as the Lord sware unto them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them, to destroy them from among the host, until they were consumed. Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. During these years the people were constantly reminded that they were under the divine rebuke. In the rebellion at Kadesh they had rejected God, and God had for the time rejected them. Since they had proved unfaithful to His covenant, they were not to receive the sign of the covenant, the rite of circumcision. Their desire to return to the land of slavery had shown them to be unworthy of freedom, and the ordinance of the Passover instituted to commemorate the deliverance from bondage was not to be observed. Yet the continuance of the tabernacle service testified that God had not utterly forsaken His people, and His providence still supplied their wants. The Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand, said Moses, in rehearsing the history of their wanderings. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And the Levite's hymn recorded by Nehemiah vividly pictures God's care for Israel, even during these years of rejection and banishment. Thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way wherein they should go. Thou gavest also thy good spirit to instruct them, and withheldest not thy manner from their mouth, and gavest them water for their thirst. Yea, forty years didst thou sustain them in the wilderness. Their clothes waxed not old, and their feet swelled not. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 19 to 21. The wilderness wandering was not only ordained as a judgment upon the rebels and murmurers, but it was to serve as a discipline for the rising generation, preparatory to their entrance into the promised land. Moses declared to them, As a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee, to humble thee and to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or no. And he suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 5, 2, and 3. He found him in a desert land, and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about, he instructed him, he kept him as the apple of his eye. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10, and Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9. Yet the only records of their wilderness life are instances of rebellion against the Lord. The revolt of Korah had resulted in the destruction of 14,000 of Israel, and there were isolated cases that showed the same spirit of contempt for the divine authority. On one occasion, the son of an Israelitish woman and of an Egyptian, one of the mixed multitude that had come up with Israel from Egypt, left his own part of the camp, and entering that of the Israelites, claimed the right to pitch his tent there. This the divine law forbade him to do the descendants of an Egyptian being excluded from the congregation until the third generation. A dispute arose between him and an Israelite, and the matter being referred to the judges was decided against the offender. Enraged at this decision, he cursed the judge, and in the heat of passion blasphemed the name of God. He was immediately brought before Moses. The command had been given, he that curseth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Exodus chapter 21, verse 17. But no provision had been made to meet this case. 
So terrible was the crime that there was felt to be a necessity for special direction from God. The man was placed in ward until the will of the Lord could be ascertained. God himself pronounced the sentence. By the divine direction, the blasphemer was conducted outside the camp and stoned to death. Those who had been witnesses to the sin placed their hands upon his head, thus solemnly testifying to the truth of the charge against him. Then they threw the first stones, and the people who stood by afterward joined in executing the sentence. This was followed by the announcement of a law to meet similar offenses. Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curseth his God shall bear his sin, and he that blasphemeth the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death, and all the congregation shall certainly stone him. As well the stranger, as he that is born in the land, when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord, shall be put to death. Leviticus chapter 24, verses 15 and 16. There are those who will question God's love and His justice in visiting so severe punishment for words spoken in the heat of passion. But both love and justice require it to be shown that utterances prompted by malice against God are a great sin. The retribution visited upon the first offender would be a warning to others that God's name is to be held in reverence. But had this man's sin been permitted to pass unpunished, Others would have been demoralized, and as the result, many lives must eventually have been sacrificed. The mixed multitude that came up with the Israelites from Egypt were a source of continual temptation and trouble. They professed to have renounced idolatry and to worship the true God, but their early education and training had molded their habits and character, and they were more or less corrupted with idolatry and with irreverence for God. They were oftenest the ones to stir up strife, and were the first to complain, and they leavened the camp with their idolatrous practices and their murmurings against God. Soon after the return into the wilderness, an instance of Sabbath violation occurred under circumstances that rendered it a case of peculiar guilt. The Lord's announcement that He would disinherit Israel had roused a spirit of rebellion. One of the people, angry at being excluded from Canaan, and determined to show his defiance of God's law, ventured upon open transgression of the fourth commandment by going out to gather sticks upon the Sabbath. During the sojourn in the wilderness, the kindling of fires upon the seventh day had been strictly prohibited. The prohibition was not to extend to the land of Canaan, where the severity of the climate would often render fires a necessity, but in the wilderness, fire was not needed for warmth. The act of this man was a willful and deliberate violation of the fourth commandment, a sin not of thoughtlessness or ignorance, but of presumption. He was taken in the act and brought before Moses. It had already been declared that Sabbath breaking should be punished with death, but it had not yet been revealed how the penalty was to be inflicted. The case was brought by Moses before the Lord, and the direction was given, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. Numbers chapter 15, verse 35. The sins of blasphemy and willful Sabbath breaking received the same punishment, being equally an expression of contempt for the authority of God. In our day, there are many who reject the creation Sabbath as a Jewish institution and urge that if it is to be kept, the penalty of death must be inflicted for its violation. But we see that blasphemy received the same punishment as did Sabbath-breaking. Shall we therefore conclude that the third commandment also is to be set aside as applicable only to the Jews? Yet the argument drawn from the death penalty applies to the third, the fifth, and indeed to nearly all the ten precepts, equally with the fourth. Though God may not now punish the transgression of His law with temporal penalties, yet His word declares that the wages of sin is death, and in the final execution of the judgment it will be found that death is the portion of those who violate His sacred precepts. During the entire forty years in the wilderness, the people were every week reminded of the sacred obligation of the Sabbath by the miracle of the manna. Yet even this did not lead them to obedience. 
though they did not venture upon so open and bold transgression as had received such signal punishment, yet there was great laxness in the observance of the fourth commandment. God declares through his prophet, My Sabbath they greatly polluted. Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 13 to 24. And this is enumerated among the reasons for the exclusion of the first generation from the promised land. Yet their children did not learn the lesson. Such was their neglect of the Sabbath during the forty years' wandering, that though God did not prevent them from entering Canaan, he declared that they should be scattered among the heathen after the settlement in the land of promise. From Kadesh the children of Israel had turned back into the wilderness, and the period of their desert sojourn being ended, they came, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Here Miriam died and was buried. From that scene of rejoicing on the shores of the Red Sea, when Israel went forth with song and dance to celebrate Jehovah's triumph, to the wilderness grave which ended a lifelong wandering, such had been the fate of millions who with high hopes had come forth from Egypt. Sin had dashed from their lips the cup of blessing. Would the next generation learn the lesson? For all this they sinned still, and believed not for his wondrous works. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their Redeemer. Psalm 78, verses 32 to 35. Yet they did not turn to God with a sincere purpose, Though when afflicted by their enemies they sought help from him who alone could deliver, yet their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity, and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away, for he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passeth away and cometh not again. Verses 37 to 39.